we're beginning a series called Deadliest Catch. And if you have your Bibles and would turn with me to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, we're going to be looking, I'm going to be reading the first five verses of this story. Many of you may be aware of or familiar with this passage, and uh, we're going to show how this deadliest catch ties in here in just a minute. But we're going to be talking about turning failure into success. And so the Bible says this, it says, One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the shore. And then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. Man, I fished with some people like that, I'm telling you. But notice what Peter, uh, Jesus says, uh, Peter says, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Let's pray. Shall we? Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, I ask for your anointing today. Uh, Lord, we need to hear this message. Father, it needs to touch the depths of our heart to help us to become the men and women that you have called us to be. Lord, it's so easy to be distracted by the things of this world. Father, help us to stay focused on you put you first in our lives. Anoint this message, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. I'm so glad you're with us and so glad for those that are watching uh, on the internet. Uh, so glad you have joined us as well. Well, let me ask you a question. What do you do when you experience failure? When what you're doing is not working? I mean, you look around at people and it, you, you compare yourself to people. I know we're not supposed to, but we're human. We do that. And it seems like uh, the spout of God's blessing is just pouring into their lives. And they are surrounded by God's favor. And everything they do and everything they touch is anointed and successful and blessed. And here you are in a dry and barren place, and you've worked hard, and nothing you seem to be doing is making anything happen, and you, you look up to heaven, you cry, Lord, what did I do to anger you so? Why are you so upset with me? I mean, I've worked hard. Haven't caught a thing. And that's where we find the disciples this morning. They have been toiling all night long trying to catch uh, fish. Now, that's not a big thing to you or I. I we go out and we, we get a few worms or night crawlers and we get a rod and reel. We go to the pond next, you know, behind our house. We, we make a few casts and it's recreational. It's fun. And whether you catch anything or not, it's not a big deal. But for the disciples... This is their livelihood. This is their business. These are seasoned fishermen. I mean, for them not to catch fish is like Michael Jordan not making any baskets, you know? But this is how they put food on the table. And here they are. They're discouraged. They're tired. They're frustrated. And so this is really the deadliest catch. It's not the environment or the hazards of trying to catch the fish on the ship, as we see in the picture here. Let me tell you what the deadliest catch is. It's when you've worked and worked and worked, and you have nothing to show for your labor, and you have to confront your family and somehow explain why you have failed to put food on the table. That's the deadliest catch. 
I, I, I don't know any man that wouldn't be willing to, uh, you know, to venture into the perils as long as they could put food and provide for their family. But here, the disciples who are seasoned aren't able to put food on the table. They have caught nothing. Now, Jesus comes into this picture when they're washing their nets, which is a sign that they're giving up. Washing the nets and folding the nets, they're, they're done. It's history. They're quitting. We're going to go home. And Jesus comes on this scene, and he says, hey, can I use one of those boats there by the seashore? And so uh, Simon Peter allows him to use his boat, and they put off a little ways from the shore. Now, you have to understand why Jesus is doing this. He's using the boat as a platform. They didn't have microphones or loudspeakers or amplifiers back in that. They didn't even have electricity. Hello? I mean, man, when you can't find your iPhone, you panic. Hello? Tracking with me? Can you imagine living back then? I mean, I don't, we'd probably starve to death. I don't know if I'd get the fire going, rubbing two sticks together. But here they are, haven't caught anything. And Jesus comes on the scene, and, and he uses the boat as a platform because his voice will carry, it will echo off of the water, and, and this large crowd that have gathered around will be able to hear better. And Jesus is teaching. He's sharing some truth. And so after he speaks, he tells Peter, Peter, let's take the boat and let's go to deep water. Let's go to deep water. And so they go to deep water and they catch a huge pull of fish. That's what I call turning failure into success. Now, Jesus never does miracles to show off. He wanted to use this opportunity to teach a lesson, to share a truth. And Jesus, we find throughout his ministry, was constantly the master teacher. And so in this passage that we're looking today, we find four important lessons that I want to share with you that he is teaching the disciples. And they're lessons that we need to learn how to turn failure into success, how to take defeat and turn it into victory, regardless of whether you're failing financially or where, whether you may be failing in your marriage or whether you may be failing in your business or that dream that you had that seems to be failing. These four things make a difference in your life. Number one, let's jump right into it. The first thing that you need to see and recognize, the first step is this. Invite Jesus in the boat. Invite Jesus in the boat, into your situation. Give him control. The starting point of success and victory is getting Jesus in your boat. Look at what the Bible says in Luke 5, verse 3 and 4. It says, Jesus got into one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon, to teach the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, now go out where it's deeper and let down your nets and you'll catch. Now listen to this. The Son of God is saying, you'll catch a lot of fish. Listen, if you don't get anything else from what I'm saying this this morning, you need to recognize that if you want to be successful, if you want to be victorious, you've got to get Jesus in the boat. When Jesus was in the boat, they caught more in 10 minutes than they did in 10 hours. Jesus was in the boat. Now, what was the difference? Think about it. Now, I think it was the same fish, the same lake, the same boat, the same fishermen, the same nets. But when Jesus got in the boat, he made the difference. Let me ask you today, is Jesus in your boat today? Have you invited him into every situation, every circumstance, whatever it may be you're going through? Have you invited Jesus into that situation? 
Well, Pastor, what does the boat represent? Well, to Peter, it represented his business. It represented his livelihood. It represented how he put food on the table. It represented how he met the needs of his family. So to, to Peter, it was everything. And Peter allows Jesus to use his boat and invites Jesus into his business. And as a result, the incredible happens, which we're going to learn in just a moment. Now, I'm not talking about making Jesus, you know, a business partner. I want you to hear me this morning. You need to make Jesus the CEO of that situation, the CEO of your life, the number one decision maker. You know, so so often we we try to partmentalize our lives. Well, Lord, you can you can handle that. I'm going to take care of this. The Lord is big enough to handle every situation in your life. You need to make Him first. I've got to give Him. Every area of my life. If you don't give every area of your life, listen to me. He can't bless it. You know, uh, uh, Alicia and Jordan are here, and they have three wonderful children, Kennedy, Hudson, and Preston. The other day, I get up early, and guess who else gets up early? Kennedy and Hudson. Grandpa, I want juice. I want to get them juice. Grandpa, I'm hungry. Okay, well, let's. So I, I got out, gave them a couple of bowls. And I got out, I let them pick their cereal. And Kennedy, I fixed her breakfast. And then I said, Hudson, give me your bowl. I'm going to put your cereal in your bowl. He wouldn't give me the bowl. I said, Hudson, you. You're not going to get any food unless you give me the bowl. And he's like holding it. I mean, it was kind of one of those cartoon bowls. No, you've got to give me the bowl. You've got to give it up so I can put cereal. I, I think it was Trickster for Kids. He said, I want the bunny rabbit. That's the one I want. So <clears throat> we're just like that. God wants to bless you. God wants to minister to you. But you've got to give the situation up. You've got to let go. We hang on to it like it's something precious. It's my problem. It's my situation. It's my hurt. And, and we don't give it up. I don't know. Is it pride? Is it why won't we give it up? And hear me this, this morning. I'm challenging you, whatever it is whether it's your business, your finances, your marriage, a relationship that you're struggling in. You've got to get Jesus in the boat. You've got to give it up and let him take care of it, and he will bless you as a result. Now, catch the sequence here of events. You know, Jesus uses Peter's boat for his purpose. Peter offered it, and, God, and, and the Lord uses it. But notice the second part of that is after Jesus finishes, he says, Peter, Peter, let's launch out into the deep. Now, there's a princi the principle of priority here. When you put God first in whatever it is, whether it's your finances, your marriage, your situation that you're going through, when you put God first, God can bless it. And that's exactly what happened with Peter. Peter allowed the Lord to use his boat, and God blessed it. Extraordinary. Jesus is saying, look, put me first, and I'll bless your marriage. Put me first, and I'll bless your finances. Put me first, and I'll bless your business. I'll bless your investments. I'll put me first, and whatever the situation is, and watch what I do when you put it in my hands. I will bless it. So the first thing is we need to get Jesus in our boat, in the situation, in the circumstance. The second thing is this. We need to admit that my own efforts have failed. 
Look at what the Bible says in Luke chapter 5, verse 5. Simon answered, Master, we've worked all night long and caught nothing. We've worked all night long. As I said earlier, this is no big deal for us. A couple of hours of re recreational fishing. If we don't catch anything, well, we go in and watch a football game. Hello? Or uh, Motor Trend. That's kind of a new channel. I've been wa watching them. Michael Jordan, you here? Yeah. That's a great show. I don't, I don't know anything about putting automobiles together, but that's an incredible channel. I'm digressing here. But it was, it's no big deal for us. But for them, this was their livelihood. It was like they were unemployed. And they didn't have any stimulus check. They didn't have any type of unemployment check. When they didn't catch any fish, that was it. But when Jesus got in the boat, he, he showed them where to go. You know, these are grown, seasoned fishermen. Uh, they've grown up on the lake. They know where to fish. They know what time it is to fish. They know what time of the day to fish. They know how far down they need to drop their nets. But even seasoned fishermen sometimes can fail at what they're trying to accomplish. It wasn't that these guys didn't know what they were doing. It wasn't. They, in fact, they were doing what they do best. They were doing what they were gifted and had trained and all their life had done. And so when, when Peter says to Jesus, we've worked all night long, we've worked hard, but we have caught nothing. In essence, what Peter is saying, look, you know, our best isn't good enough. Have you ever been there? Uh, you know, you've heard me say this, my best thinking has gotten me in the worst trouble. It has. When you've given it all you've got and you come up empty, when you've given it all you've got and you haven't anything to show for it. Now, I want to encourage you today. You know, when you don't have anything to show for it, first of all, you need to get Jesus in the boat. And secondly, you have to admit that, look, it's not not my town. Lord, you're going to have to make this happen. Everything I'm doing is not working. As I said earlier, sometimes we think the Lord is just for spiritual things. I'm just going to trust you, Lord, for spiritual things. Secular things I'm going to do, you know. When we compartmentalize our lives, we get ourselves in trouble. The Lord needs to be a part of every area of your life. Wherever you go, whatever you do, you know, the Bible says pray without ceasing. We've talked about that. What does that mean? That means in every area of your life, you can call out to the Lord. In the grocery store, uh, Lord, w help me to find the sales. That's easy. I do a lot of the shopping now. I, I go for those buy one, get one free type things. And then I go overboard. That's why we have 10 packets of Oreo cookies. Buy one, get one free. Well, if I buy more, buy one, get one free, then I've got a lot of free stuff. Woo! Pam bought these Oreo cookies with mint flavor in the middle. Man, they are so good. They are so good. I'm telling you. In fact, you know, you've ever been walking down the aisle and you go past the Oreos and it's like they talk to you. Have you had a bad day? Uh-huh. For long, they're in the cart. And I love grocery shopping without Pam because I can buy whatever I want. None of this, put that back. Amen. No, my wife is wonderful. We need to make sure that's not on the video for later. Amen. Well, how can we fail? Well, there's several ways, many ways. Let me go through these real quick. One is arrogance. We can fail because of arrogance. 
You know, the Bible says pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. When we think we've got it all under control and we can handle it, we don't need God's help, guess what? We're setting ourselves up for failure. Another one is disobedience. The Bible says this in Deuteronomy 11. It says, you will be cursed if you disobey the commands of God. Did you know that was in the Bible? Did you know that? And people will say, Pastor, how come things aren't going my way? How come things are so bad in my life? Because God has told you to do something and you're not doing it. Hello? When we obey God's blessing, uh, obey God's word, we will receive his blessing. The Bible is so clear about that. The third thing is doubt. The Bible says this in James 1, 6, 7, and 8. It says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave blown and tossed by the wind. Verse 7 says, that person should not expect to receive anything. Wow, that's pretty strong. When you doubt, the Bible says you shouldn't expect to receive anything from the Lord. As such a person is double-minded and unstable in all their ways. Sometimes we just can't make up our minds. We go this way, we go that way. Why? Because we never stop to get God's direction in our lives or what he wants for us. We're too busy chasing after some leaf that's being drifted in the wind instead of finding the concrete purpose that God has for your life. Well, how do you do that? You develop a relationship with God. You put him number one in your life. The third step that I want you to see is this. I obey what Jesus tells me. I obey what Jesus tells me. It's called obedience. First of all, I get Jesus in the boat. Secondly, I admit that my best isn't working. And the third step is this. I obey what Jesus tells me to do. Now, look at verse 4 of Luke 5. It says, then Jesus said, launch out into the deep water. Simon so answered, Master, we, we worked hard all night, and we haven't caught anything. But notice what he says, but because you say so. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Notice that. But because you say so. You know, the second difference why they caught a lot of fish in 10 minutes when they couldn't do it in 10 hours is, is they're now fishing under Jesus' instruction. They knew when to fish. The Bible says now. Where to fish? Launch out into the deep. How? Let down your nets. He's given them spe specific instructions. He is guiding them step by step in the very area where they have failed. I want you to notice Peter's reaction to Jesus' instruction. He didn't argue. Yes, he did say, you know, we've worked hard. I, he's just giving Jesus a little history. Yeah, we've worked hard. All night and haven't caught anything. But there's something different. Jesus is in the boat. And so Peter takes a whole different approach. He didn't let his feelings sway him. You know, I'm tired. I'm frustrated. I haven't had anything to eat. We've been on the water. We've been trying to catch fish. Lord, why don't we just go home? Why don't we come back when we're fresh, when we've been rested, and we'll try it again? No, he didn't argue with Jesus. He said, but because you say so. Listen, some of you need to do that. Some of you need to take the same approach. Yes, you're, you're coming up empty. Yes, you're coming up. You've worked hard, and it seems like nothing seems to be happening in your life. But when you invite Jesus in the boat, when he's a, a part of that ship, that situation, that circumstance, things change. Well... Okay, I'm going to work on that marriage, Lord, because you say so. The difference is you're in the boat. 
I don't see how this is going to work, but because you say so. This business of mine, I don't see how it's going to, it's going to make it. It just seems like it's going the wrong direction. I, my competitors seem to be beating up on me. Jesus is now in your boat. You admit it's not your best thinking that's gotten you where you to victory. So you need to look to the Lord. And because you say so, Lord, I'm going to trust you one more time. I'm going to trust you because you say so. First, we get Jesus in the boat. Then we admit our weakness. And then third, I admit that I can't do it on my own. But because you say so, I'm going to obey. And what is it that God is saying to you? Could it be that this morning God is saying to you, I want you to accept my son, Jesus Christ, into your life? Could he be saying, I want you to get involved in some ministry at the church? Could he be saying, I want you to tithe more or give offerings more to, to some ministry? I want to, he wants you to forgive some. Well, I don't want to forgive that person. Look what they did to me. The Bible tells us, that we are to forgive as he has forgiven us. Every time you disobey, you bring a curse into your life. That's what the Word of God says. That's not what I'm saying. The Word of God says that. If you want to be blessed, put Jesus first. Get him into your boat, into the situation. Make him the CEO of that problem or that issue, whatever it may be. Admit that it's not your best thinking that's going to turn things around. You obey what he tells you to do. And because he says so, you step out. A lot of people, look, Jesus said, launch out into deep waters. Preston's going to be one of our great evangelists someday. He's already wanting to put in his word. Amen. But notice, notice. You know, a lot of times we, we chase after the shallow end. It's safer. We don't have to worry about big waves. I want to challenge you. Could it be that God is asking you to go to the next level? God's wanting to get you out of the shallow end and into deep waters. God's wanting to bless you. Why? Because that's where the big fish are, not in the shallow end. The big fish are in deep waters. And so Peter obeyed, and he went into deep waters, and he let down the net. Now, I think this is just extraordinary. It takes us to, to the fourth point that I want you to see is simply this. You can expect Jesus to turn things around. God will turn it around for your good. You can expect that. And that's exactly what happened. When he put down the net, the Bible says that there was such a huge, uh, uh, I don't know what the word is, group of fish. There was such a haul of fish that their nets couldn't handle it all. They were about to sink. They had to get another boat to come in to help with the fish that were coming on board. And I think Peter was somewhat expecting something. I think he was anticipating. He had Jesus in the boat. He had God's plan in his mind and God's promise in his heart because he was doing it God's way and in God's timing. You know, God's work done, God's way, does not lack God's support. In other words, it's simply this, where God guides, God provides. Where God leads, he will make the provisions available. He will support. It's so important that we recognize. Look at verse 6. Look at this. When the fishermen did what Jesus told them, they were obedient. When the fishermen did as Jesus told them, they caught so many fish that the nets began to break. So they called their partners from the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full. They were almost sinking. Wow. That is amazing. I want to tell you a story about a, a gentleman who helped us 
start Frontline. He was actually, we had a provisional board. He was a part of our board. He was a businessman. He is now uh, living in Canada. And so we didn't have an office, and he was a friend. I, I said, boy, you know, I just feel like the Lord leading me to start. At the time, we didn't have a church name. We just, I just to start a church. And so he said, you know what? I've got an extra office. He said, why don't you come and use that office? And I said, well, I don't have an income. He said, well, you don't have to pay anything. I'm going to let you use it for as long as you need it. I said, okay. And so every morning, I didn't have a job. I didn't have a paycheck, but I got up. Every morning, I was at that office at 830. And, and I did a number of things. I, I made phone calls. I tried to, you know, see if churches would allow somebody that they didn't recognize to come speak. And that didn't work out very well. But I just kept going. I would spend time in prayer, reading my Bibles. I'd work on sermons. I would do music. I would keep myself busy saying, Lord, you know, I feel like you called me to this. And so uh, this businessman said, uh, Nate, I'm going to start tithing to your church. And so he, he, he came in my office, and he brought two checks. One was his tithe, and then he gave another check. I said, well, what's the second check for? He said, this is from my business. I'm putting Jesus first in my business. And so I'm going to tithe from what my business makes to Frontline. That really touched me. And he did this month after month after month. And then uh, shortly after I started, some of you know, we had two uh, wonderful guys. I was talking to Pastor Dominique about this yesterday, Matt Pilot, who's now at a big church up in uh, doing a great work up in Port St. Lucie, and Chris McCowan, who is now at Christian Life Center, but he was at the largest church of the Church of God. Well, both of these guys wound up on my doorstep. They had been brutally fired uh, from another church, and they said, would you be interested in bringing two other staff members on board? I said, well, yeah. You can join. I don't know if I can pay you, but come on. And so, and I was telling her about our humble beginning. We had one computer, and here are three pastors. And we're like, okay, Chris, from two to four, you can use the computer. And then from Matt, from one to, you know, we would take turns. And in fact, even with pens, like, can, can I borrow that pen? I, it was... It would be funny. We could make a movie about it. This is how we started Frontline. We didn't have anything. But God started blessing, and I was able to pay them salaries. But anyway, it was as a result of this, this businessman giving to us. And I remember one day he came in to our office, to my office, and he was white as a ghost. And he said, Nate, I, I think I'm in trouble. I said, what's up? He said, well... I've made an investment in commodities. And if you know anything about commodities, you can lose a lot of money quick, like boom. You can lose thousands of dollars. And he had borrowed money off a credit card, and he was going to do this. And, and uh, things had gone south. And he, was, he said, I don't know how I'm going to pay for this. And I said, you don't have to worry about it. God's going to take care of it. He said, what? I said, God's going to turn it around. You be patient. Watch. And here's why. You have put Jesus first in your life. You've got him in your boat. You're recognizing that it's not your brilliance that's going to make you millions. You're admitting that. And thirdly, and just what we're talking about that, I want you to be obedient to what God tells you to do. And we're going to pray. And right there in that little office, we prayed. And if I hadn't witnessed this, I, I wouldn't have believed it, but I witnessed this. God turned the commodities around. And literally, listen to me, and he can verify it. Within six months, that deficit went to 
million dollars. Four million dollars. We went out to lunch and I I said to this businessman, it's because you were faithful in giving to the Lord. Just like Peter gave the boat to Jesus as a result of putting Jesus, allowing Jesus in the boat. I want you to see, look at verse 11. Um, they've just caught, well, let me, the end of verse 6, it says, the, the boats were filled so full that they were about to sink. And then look at verse 11. Now, I think this is amazing. They have caught more fish than they've ever caught, ever. One, one launching. They get the fish on shore, and notice what they do. They left their nets and immediately follow Jesus. What? Are you kidding me? I mean, they just had the biggest score. I mean, I mean, God has blessed them beyond measure. They had to call other boats, come help us. We're going to sink. And those boats almost went under. They get the fish on shore, and they just leave the catch. I, th I just think that is amazing. You see, they were more interested in following the blesser than having the blessing. So many times, listen to me, church, uh, and I, I listen, so many times Christians are more interested in the blessing than the blessor. I'm telling you, if you put Jesus first in your life and you seek the blessor, he'll take care of the blessing. I don't believe that, Pastor Nate. I don't care if you believe it or not. It's the truth. I, my wife can attest to this. I, I don't know how we have made it starting this church. God has been good to us. Uh, but, you know, I, I have a friend who is in the villages, and he'll call and he'll say, you know, uh, we just had a family come in, and they gave us a check for $50,000. And then the next week, another family came in and gave us a check for $30,000. And, and we had one gentleman came in and gave us an $80,000 check. I said, you need to shut up. You are discouraging me. The high heavens. Well, we've never had anyone give like that. We've had people give substantially, but I've never gotten a $30,000 check. Hello? But God has provided. God has met our need. Well, we, don't, we don't have any debt. We don't, we don't take a loan from the bank. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that. If God leads us to that, we'll do that. But right now, we, uh, we're kind of a cash-only church, and God has provided. And God has used many of you. Many of you, in fact, through this pandemic, some of you said, you know, Pastor, God has laid on my heart just to give a little extra to help the church. And I'm grateful for that because we've needed it. You know, it's not only is it tough on businesses and small businesses and, and families, it's also tough on churches. But God has used you and God has helped us to meet every one of our needs. In fact, we're, we're doing talking about faith. I, I, this isn't in my notes. I know I'm supposed to have already prayed by now, but I, we, we bring on a staff member. In the middle of a pandemic. That's not very smart, Pastor Nate. I told you, my, my thinking gets me in a lot of trouble, but God provides. I feel like God laid this on my heart. And we're so grateful for Pastor Dominique. She is a blessing. She works hard. She, she's starting to work me into a work me. I, I'm telling you, she, we need to do this, Pastor Nate. You got to do that. And just wow. I'm like, yes, it's exciting. And Kim and Chris, man, they, they make me dizzy. All the kids they chase, and it's growing. In fact, they just had three, three new kids to the kids' department today. <laughs> Amen. Alicia and Jordan's 
three kids. And Pastor Leanne with our youth and Wendy helps with that. We're so grateful. And, and Jordan and Alicia have it on their hearts to help us with uh, young marrieds and young adults. And, you know, we were a actually putting their stuff in storage because they don't have a home or apartment right now. And a lady came up, and I, here I am. I'm, I'm all grimy and sweaty and short pants on. And, and I hear this, Pastor Nate! I'm like, oh, my goodness. You know, I don't see me like this. Pastor Nate came running up to me, and we kind of elbow bumped. So where are you? Where are you ministering now? I said, well, we're front lines uh, in West Boca at the Loggers Run shop. She said, wow, you know, I've got a new family in town, and, and, and they want to get involved in a church that has a children and youth program. I said, well, we've got one of the best. And, and we have some young adults, college-age students. I said, well, we're, we're starting a ministry. We're going to be reaching out. She says, you know what? I'm not going to tell them how to get there. I'm like, what? I said, no, I'm going to bring them myself. And so I and never know. In a week or two, we may have some people coming. And I just sense that God is doing some incredible things. At Frontline, we have Jesus in our boat. And I have to admit to you, it's not my great thinking that's going to grow the church. He's in the boat. He's the captain of the ship. I'm just a servant. And if I'll be obedient and stop trying to do my own thing, but listen to what, even when it doesn't make sense, like bringing a staff member on in the middle of a pandemic, that doesn't make sense. Doing a Christmas musical in the middle of a pandemic, that doesn't make sense. That's stupid. I had someone say that. You know, a lot of churches aren't, doing Christmas musical and events because of the coronavirus. And I said, well, that's, that's between them and the Lord. God has called us to reach people for Christ. And for those that will come and will hear the message, we're going to fulfill the great commission that God has called us to. Amen. I'm not going to let this coronavirus keep us from preaching the word, singing and sharing the gospel. We're going to be men and women allow Jesus to be in the boat. We're going to listen and obey him even when, we, when it doesn't make sense. And we're going to expect, we're going to expect that God's going to fill the nets. Amen. Amen. You guys look great today. And here's what I know. The Lord is just smiling ear to ear. Because of his love for you. He's watching you right now. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. He, he is obsessed with you. His thoughts concerning you outnumber the sands of the sea. I don't know if we can really grasp that. I mean, you can't even count a handful of sand. He says his thoughts concerning you outnumber the sands of the sea. Well, why am I going through this stuff? Because he wants you to depend on him. He's a gentleman. As long as you want to do it your way, he's going to let you. And you'll come to the place like I did. I can't do it on my own. I'm not smart enough to make it happen. There's a living God who cares for me. And I'm going to cast my cares on him. I'm going to trust him, even when it doesn't make sense. I'm going to believe him to, to bring in the harvest. I'm going to exhibit faith. Now, let me be honest with you. I'm a pastor. Now, hear me. Because I, I know some of you guys think I'm super Christian. I need to wear a cape. There are times when I struggle to trust God. Hello? Can I just be honest? Can I be real? But I have to develop that relationship. I have to get along with God. And sometimes getting a cup of coffee helps. And I'll pace the floor. I got up early this morning, 3 o'clock. 
spent the first hour just talking with the Lord because I need his help. I need his help. And he has been so good to me. He has just been so good to me. I'm almost 60 years old. I don't regret a moment of my life. If you could see a snapshot of Pastor Nate, you would see there have been those seasons where I haven't trusted God. I've tried to do my own thing. But when I put my trust in him, he has never let me down. That's the key. Develop a relationship with him. Let's pray. Father, I love you. And I know you've been a part of this service. And I just have sensed your Holy Spirit touching and tugging in our hearts. And this, Lord, this message is for a lot of people here today. I just sense that, that Lord, there is a situation, an issue, a circumstance that they're wondering why they're going through it. Why am I experiencing this failure? It seems like everyone else is blessed, but when it comes to me, I, I, I seem to get the short straw. Lord, I pray that you would encourage your people. Challenge us. Lord, you so desire for us to have a relationship with you. You so want us just to share our heart, get along with you, or go to the beach, or go to the park, and just talk with you. You have big ears to hear us. And Lord, sometimes you're very subtle. But Lord, you hear us. And you do move and work miracles in our lives when we trust you. When we make you number one. Father, help us. Give us the strength to do that. To trust you. In every circumstance. Help us to get you in our boat, in our situation, in our problem. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want you to hear me this morning. I, I just sense this is a special morning. You're here and you're experiencing or have experienced failure. or You're, you're just questioning, Lord, why? And you need God's touch in your life in that situation in a relationship, or in your finances, or a health issue, or your business, your investments, whatever it is, it's dear to your heart and you've kind of kept to yourself, I want to challenge you, you got to let it go. you got to give it to Him. And He'll fill your bowl. He'll bless you if you let go. I'm not going to, I know we're in covid we try to be smart. I'm not going to ask you to come forward. This is a come forward type of morning, but I'm going to ask you to raise your hand right now. Don't hesitate. If you want God to touch that situation or circumstance right now, raise your hand. Yes, look at all the hands. God sees many of us. Many of us need God's touch in this situation, that circumstance, that problem. The second question I want to ask is simply this. You can put your hands down. Maybe you're here and you've never invited Jesus Christ into your life. You, maybe you've been to church, but you've never had a relationship with the Lord. If that's you, we're going to pray a simple prayer in a minute, but I want to give an opportunity. We always try to make an opportunity available for people to get right with the Lord. If that's you, would you raise your hand right now? We're going to pray for you. God sees. And yes. Anyone else? Right up, right down. Yes, God sees. God knows. Hallelujah. I'm going to invite everyone to stand with me. We had several that raised their hands in both of these questions. And so I want us to pray a prayer. This isn't a formula. But I want you just to pray this prayer. And make it from the depth of your heart. And then I'm going to pray for all of us, everyone that raised their hands that are going through situations. But pray this, everyone, would you just lift your voice? And if you raise your hand and say, you know, I, I want to have a relationship with the Lord, I want you to mean this in your heart. The Bible says when you pray this prayer, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's an incredible thing. You know, this earth is just temporary, but there is a place where we will spend eternity 
And it's an incredible place. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Forgive me of all my sin. Cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. I believe you died on a cross because you loved me. And I believe and I testify that you rose from the grave and now live right hand of the Father. And from this day forward, I will live for you all my days as you give me strength. Father, I pray for every hand that was lifted. Lord, they're going through a situation or circumstance. Lord, you even warned us that in this world we would experience trouble. But Father, you would keep us and help us to walk through the storms of life. Lord, I pray right now for every situation, every problem, every issue that, that this congregation and all the hands that were lifted that they represent. Lord, we're going to get you in our boat, in that situation, in those circumstances. We're going to put you first. We're going to recognize that only you can make the difference. And so, Lord, I ask, as we expect a miracle in this situation, Lord, do the impossible. With men, it's impossible, but not with you. For with you, the Bible says, all things are possible. And so, Lord, we believe that. And so, Lord, I believe that the windows are going to open wide for those that need a financial miracle. Lord, I believe the relationships are going to be healed because you're the great healer, the, the great counselor. Father, I believe that there are going to be physical needs. That, Lord, people are going to say, look what God did. Look how God moved. Father, whatever it may be that, Lord, we represent in this church, Father, work a miracle, we pray. Lord, we give you glory. You're an awesome God. And Lord, it's our privilege to worship you today. And Lord, we look forward to that moment when we come back together with one another to worship and lift you up once again. Thank you, Lord, for being our, our God. We give you praise for all that you're doing in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You look great today. So glad you're here. Yes, give God a clap offering. You can't leave until you elbow bump at least 10 people, okay? Come on, elbow bump. Let them know you appreciate them. We'll get back to hugging down the road, but they say we can elbow bump. So go in the power of our Lord and Savior. May His grace be with you. Amen.